Yeah. Hey, everyone. Um, thank you so much. My name is DeAndrea Salvador. I'm joined by some very esteemed guests. Before we dive in, um, since the slides are over here, I'll walk through a quick overview, and then we're going to have a Q&A discussion, as well as some time for questions at the end. Um, and it was really nice of Alex to uh, say best, but I think we might just be the newest. And like all new things, is very shiny and bright and exciting. Uh, but you know, right after that comes the really important and hard work to bring value um, to all of our missions and work together. So thanks everybody for uh, the opportunity to be here. Um, so again, I am DeAndrea. I work at Eli for, as Director of Partnerships and No Collective, also known as the National Open Data for Electrification Collective, um, was really the brainchild of a number of electrification-focused organizations coming together over the last few months to really address one of what we see is a key gap um, in the market to date. So as I mentioned, uh, No Collective is dedicated to sourcing, structuring, and maintaining comprehensive data on every residential electrification incentive program in the United States. And what you'll see here are essentially the organizations that are putting in some of the initial groundwork to launch Node. Um, so that's BDC, Building Decarbonization Coalition, uh, Eli, Desire, which is a project of the North Carolina Clean Energy Technology Center, Rewiring America, and also RMI, which is also known as the Rocky Mountain Institute. And I'm also very excited that as of a few weeks ago, we were officially accepted as a LF Energy Sandbox project. So we're really excited about the work underway to um, really work towards open data um, as a part of our key initiatives here. So let's just think a little bit as we heard about incentives and rebates. And from what we can tell so far, there are thousands and thousands of incentives across the United States today. And all might have just slight varying differences in terms of requirements or even how those requirements are described and listed. And they are constantly in flux as you're seeing things ranging from the rules changes to funding level status changes. And they often can span multiple jurisdictions within the same state particularly that can be around an actual residential or municipal area, or it could be around a utility. So all of this coming together creates a lot of key challenges that organizations, but also consumers, have to face when thinking about incentives and rebates, one of which is just how do we source accurate data and information uh, in this uh, really complex and ever-evolving system. The other one is how can this be structured so that we can build and deploy much more innovation and tools? And then finally, given that this is something that is constantly in flux, how can we maintain accurate data such that we can again see uh, much more potential uh, throughout communities? Uh, in throughout the US. And one thing that we really notice is that multiple organizations, many more beyond the organizations who are working together to help launch Node, are working to try to solve this challenge and all taking very similar yet different approaches. And this is creating duplication of effort and work, um, and even sometimes contributing to the fractured landscape. And the thought for Node really came to making this data open source, uh, open data, such that it really can be unif unified as the gold standard and source of truth to help uh, power many more programs and information. So thanks to one of our partners for Node at, R at RMI, uh, we just thought it'd be good to think about and look at the scope of incentives. Uh, and this is over the next five years, especially with the uh, Inflation Reduction Act and the additional funds that we're expecting to start flowing into communities, but also many of the already existing programs as well. There is roughly $100 billion in incentives for energy efficiency and building electrification expected over the next five years. Yet, if we keep having this process be continually fractionated, that's a lot of missed opportunity, both for consumers, but also for uh, business communities, researchers, um, contractors, and many of the types of organizations that we interface with or represent. 
So as a quick recap for Node, we saw that many organizations are independently creating or maybe even relying on their own spreadsheets that are at constant risk of being out to date or potentially incorrect. Uh, and a couple of our initial goals and things that we're aligning around is working together to create a single unified data set in a standardized format to help save time, improve quality, um, and also work directly with programs such that they know this data um, that is shared is open accessible um, and they can go to one source to help deploy it to many different use cases. Um, the second is really a longer term vision for Node, which is working with and helping program implementers and administrators to publish information directly in the standardized format so we can really aggregate and get closer to becoming a open source of truth for rebate and incentive data across the US. So this is again a recap of Node as our intent is for open accessible structured data, built, really building a broad coalition of providers, users, stakeholders, and working directly uh, through LF Energy to come up with transparent governance such that this can uh, really live up to the mission and ideals that we've heard throughout a number of projects today. So to talk about how this is new, um, I believe we announced Node um, just at the end of March, and then a few weeks later, we were adopted as an LF Energy project. So really over the next few months, what our data working group has been focused on is combining the founding member data and using that to essentially seed the Node data repository, as long with working towards a V1 of a schema that we can provide for requests for comment. Uh, we are looking at having the schema, as well as um, the data either all aggregated or shared from all founding members coming in within the next few uh, weeks, hopefully. Uh, but months, I like to give a little room, because uh, it is summertime and you know there's a lot happening after all. Um, and then as you see from this founding member data and the node data repository, there's so many different use cases, some of which we might not even know of yet, that we think this can help. So it can be everything from contractor tools because uh, we know only a small percent of contractors are um, offering rebates for electrification today. It can be uh, consumer calculators or even policy information that this helps to build and grow uh, for communities nationwide. That said, that is really geared towards creating the initial uh, seat lane of work. What we soon want to work towards is not just having it be the founding member uh, contributed data that is given to the open source collective, but really starting to work directly with other contributors. Since our announcement, I think we've had a good breadth of potential contributors that have expressed interest ranging from uh, municipalities, state energy offices, companies and even contractors themselves um, and really in the core is really working with program or orgs who are the owners of those programs to contribute data as well then ultimately which we know will take more time is creating um, a API that can connect directly with program owners and contribute data um, so that we can have more of a real-time uh, status update from programs directly. Um, but we also want to co-create this uh, directly with program owners. So we want to establish those uh, continued conversations and really make sure what No Collective can deliver um, is something that works directly with their use cases as well as helps to further um, spur electrification across the US. So again, a recap of just some of the types of uh, archetypes that we think can benefit from open data is everything from startups to governments, but also community-based organizations, OEMs, which we've seen some OEM interest, contractors as well. And here is just looking at some of these use cases in action. Um, so you'll see on the center we have Desire, which Steve represents, but we also have a few other um, inspired uh, 
the Span.io uses Rewiring America, who are here from more today. They're open API for this incentive and rebate data to then put that onto their website to offer um, more dynamic um, consumer educational flows. And then in California, Bayren is looking at uh, helping consumers to understand their potential um, and available incentives for their communities as well. So our progress so far, and we're still building pretty rapidly, is that uh, over 2,000 incentives have been mapped just among founding members for our data working group. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a pretty healthy announcement wait list, uh, and we are building the framework and processes to really hopefully rapidly onboard contributors of all types. And again, the co-design with key stakeholders. Um, so we have a number of interested parties who uh, once the kind of initial schema is out there to provide things that they can poke and prod and give their feedback to have essentially expressed interest in doing exactly that. Um, just in terms of the proposed data scope, uh, this is also something that everyone will be able to see later, um, but we really are focusing more on the residential electrification and decarbonization measures. You'll see that as a range of uh, different areas and types uh, that we are covering. And we're broadly focused on electrification, um, so everything ranging from heat pumps to um, potentially even electric wiring are the different types of measures that we would like to be included as a part of our open data, data um, work. So over the next six months, as I mentioned before, we're really working towards sharing and structuring our existing data, onboarding more contributors, developing the data specification, governance structure, maintenance and validation process, um, and also working towards our long-term and more sustainable funding model to help support any of the maintenance and ongoing work that will be needed. Um, and I'm gonna move over there, and then we have a series of questions for uh, our panel. So just give me a sec. Yeah. Uh, oh, test. Yes, perfect. Uh, so I think it would be great if everyone could just take a couple minutes and do a quick round of introductions. Um, all of you just have really great experiences and things so far, so I think it would be helpful to set the stage and talk a little bit more about you as well as the organization uh, that you're representing here today. Sure, thank you. Hi everyone, uh, Rose Stephens Booker here. I'm with the Building Decarbonization Coalition uh, and my title is uh, Director of State Mobilization and. Uh, you won't know what that means until I explain it to you, which I will, but I have about 15 years in the energy and climate space. I got started as a consultant doing measure and verification on behalf of utilities, also a, a need for data, <laughs> collecting baseline data to help to make sure that energy efficiency programs were being implemented and the outcomes were impactful um, for utility efficiency uh, requirements. Um, and then I moved over to the EPA and led their Energy Star Appliances Program for about eight years, uh, another use case for data where we worked with uh, everyone from manufacturers to ut utilities and retailers on making sure that products were available for customers, uh, all American consumers, um, where they work, live, play, pray, and find peace, um, that were energy efficient and certified by the Energy Star mark. Um, and we built our own API back then uh, based off of certified products that uh, manufacturers used to, or still do, uh, certify and rebates that utilities used to have um, for a lot of these product categories. Um, and then I moved over to Block Power, which is a, a black-owned company, and they were really promoting and um, working to uh, decarb buildings in uh, low-income communities of color, and really got a nuanced and um, very, I would say, integrated education on how to really speak this language in uh, places that might not look like 
I would say, folks who work in energy generally. <laughs> uh, and now I work at the Building Decarbonization Coalition. So it's been a, a long trek, and my, you know, I was walking out the door and I was telling my husband, oh, hey, I'm, I'm going to speak at this open source sustainability forum. And he was like, what? <laughs> he was like, that's my job. <laughs> and so I, I was very quickly and quite maybe aggressively articulating where the synergies were as I was dashing out the door. Um, but it's, it's kind of, see, I've seen an overlap uh, for, for many, many years. Um, at the Building Decarbonization Coalition, our main goal is to remove fossil fuels from buildings. And there's a number of ways that we can do that. But the way uh, we really would love to continue to work with the Node Collective and see that integrated is kind of utilizing a public-private partnership uh, type of oriented model where we um, are able to source and collect data from all sorts of different stakeholders and help state governments, help local governments, help the federal government be able to po point um, their constituents and folks to uh, places where they can find rebates, where they can find products. Uh, because we know the way that we have a whole entire clean energy transition is that we make it simple and we make it accessible. And data is like probably the key place and way that we can do that. And so uh, we have a, a number of uh, marketing tools that we have at BDC, and I'll get into that later. But um, I, I think for now, I'll pass it to Kristen. Hi, everyone. Is it on? Yeah, OK. Hi, Kristen Eberhard with Rewiring America. I also got started working at a utility, um, providing a service to uh, building managers and architects within the utility's jurisdiction to help them design more energy efficient buildings. Um, and I've been working in energy policy ever since. Rewiring America is a nonprofit focused on residential electrification, and our goal is to make electric the easy and obvious choice. Um, and so towards that end, we created a calculator, the IRA savings calculator, to help people see what, uh, what they could get from the IRA incentives. And then as, um, as that started to roll out, we wanted to pivot and make it the incentives savings calculator that showed you all of the incentives available so that it would make it easy for people to see like what all was available and kind of come up with their total costs. And so towards that end, we were, <laughs> we were slaving away, um, painstakingly collecting the data from every utility in every state and realized that our friends were doing the same thing and that we should get together and make that um, more av available to everybody who wants that data rather than all of us collecting it in our little silos. So we're super excited to be part of this um, open source collective and make that uh, information more available. And we are now rolling out our state-specific calculators where you can see if you live in uh, DC, Colorado, Rhode Island, or Vermont, you can see all of the incentives that are available to you. And then we're going to do about 10 more states by the end of June. Um, and all of that information will eventually be powered by the Node Collective um, database. Thank you. Hi. I'm. That's on. Yeah. I'm Steve Calland. I'm the uh, executive director of the North Carolina Clean Energy Technology Center. This is my 31st year, I think, in the clean energy space. I actually started my career getting the crap kicked out of me by utilities, uh, working on net metering rules uh, and things of that nature at the state level. Um, right out of grad school, I worked for the Solar Energy Industries Association. I wound up running eventually their state policy network and was around at the dawn of many of the country's renewable portfolio standards, public benefit funds, things of that nature. Um, I've been in North Carolina now, though, for 22 years uh, at the Clean Tech Center, first as the policy director and then uh, as the executive director. Although I will say that my claim to fame, if folks are familiar with the Desire database, and uh, the, the joke, of course, is be careful typing Desire into the internet. Uh, it can get a little sketchy. Make sure you leave that first E out. Um, but um, with the Desire database, which tracks all of the incentives um, and regulatory programs that affect clean energy, renewables, energy efficiency, uh, we've recently added electric vehicles, storage technology. We've done a little special focus on offshore wind. So we've got a lot of the data in there very qualitatively, uh, which is one of the reasons why this node collective effort is so important. Uh, but uh, the very first version of Desire was actually, if anybody's old enough to remember, Quattro Pro. Uh, I was working for the Solar Energy Industries Association, and I had a Quattro Pro spreadsheet where I was keeping track of tax credits state by state uh, and writing an article about it for the Solar Industry Journal each year. Uh, so that's where it all started. It went from there at SIA. Uh, we passed it over to IREC, the Interstate Renewable Energy Council. IREC subcontracted 
the uh, work to maintain the database to the North Carolina Solar Center, uh, which eventually became the Clean Tech Center. And then uh, many years later, I wound up in North Carolina at the Clean Tech Center, so it all came full circle. Uh, so we've been involved uh, in tracking this information. I think our first DOE contract to do this was from 1995. Uh, I found some old floppy disks, five and a quarters, where we had the very first version of the database on them. There's actually some hard copies of the, uh, the printout of those floppy disks that are floating around as well. Uh, so we've been at it a long time. There are a lot of these types of incentives out there, but there has never been a time where there was so much need to both get more of the information integrated in different places, all of the new tools, calculators, other types of products that are rolling out that need this information in a more quantitative fashion than what we had historically done with it. And also uh, to make sure that uh, we're keeping up with the pace because there's just so many new incentives rolling out right now. Uh, one of the big areas that's about to start hitting us is solar for all, uh, which is going to be a, a massive amount of uh, resources hitting state by state and uh, is going to be intertwined in all of this. And I guess if I can take one more second, just a, an anecdote about this. I, I recently went, uh, I'm in the process of electrifying my own home, and so I had a, 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 gas, uh, a gas furnace that needed to be replaced, so I'm going with an electric heat pump. I went to my local utility to get a contractor name uh, to participate in their rebate program, which I kind of knew existed. That contractor um, came out, gave me an estimate. I told them I needed to make sure that it qualified for the state rebate and for the federal tax credit. They uh, replaced a bunch of ductwork, did a really nice job, put in the unit, sent me the paperwork, and it was a SEER 14, uh, which meant that it didn't qualify for either the uh, utility rebate or the tax credit. This is a company that's on the utilities actual list of vendors for the program. So we had a, a lengthy conversation, um, and then I had a, a lengthy conversation with the state attorney general's office and the consumer protection advocate in the state. And uh, then I got a call from the general manager, and uh, they did indicate that they were willing to come out and swap the unit, and so they spec'd it out. Turned out that they did not carry a unit that actually complied with the requirements for the tax credit. Uh, so, you know, they went and actually found a unit that they don't normally carry that complied. Uh, they sent me the paperwork. I took a look at it, and it did indeed qualify for the federal tax credit. However, it did not qualify for the state utility rebate program. So in the end, uh, I've got this unit being installed. Uh, ma matter of fact, it went in today. Uh, and they're going to write me a check for the rebate program directly because they could not find a unit that complied with both. So the reason that we need to have this information available is because it's not simple. And I'm actually kind of a sophisticated customer on this, much to their dismay, I will note. <laughs> but where this gets to be complicated is when you start getting into, for example, the Solar for All program, which is targeting disadvantaged communities for very large incentives state by state, mostly for customers that probably have a credit score of 680 or less and are perhaps you know, somewhat less uh, used to digging through their utility bill to figure out what their energy load looks like. So this is a really important effort in our minds and we're really excited to be a part of it. Great, yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And I guess I realized I never gave a quick background about me or Eli. Um, so again, my name is DeAndrea. Eli focuses on contractor uh, related tools as it pertains to electrification and managing the process. Um, outside of that, I am also elected official. Um, so I'm also very deeply interested in making sure that any incentives and rebates that policymakers are putting out um, are actually reaching their fullest potential, um, as well as I serve on the National Council for Electricity Policy, which is the joint initiative of DOE and ARUC. Um, which many of that looks into affordability as well as stakeholder, uh, stakeholder engagement um, and accessibility, which all of which I think turning just desperate information into actual um, knowledge that folks can action upon and make really critical decisions with um, is such a huge and important precursor uh, to the electrification movement in the residential section. So uh, I really appreciate you sharing that deeply personal story. Uh, <laughs> and uh, hopefully it will, yeah, yeah. I, I hopefully it will help um, anyone else that they work with over time. Um, so I would love to hear, um, actually both for Rose as well as uh, Kristen, 
question. Both of you have uh, consumer-facing tools in the market and have done such great work with um, the educational aspect, uh, both from the switches on from BDC, but also uh, from the calculators that you mentioned. I'm curious if you could talk us through, I'll start with you, Rose, maybe just the role of uh, this data in terms of what you're delivering, but also what you're seeing more broadly. I mean, I'm, I'm still kind of shell-shocked from this story, um, but the one word that comes to my mind is like, the Node Collective in a perfect world is going to be a proactive <laughs> approach to offering information readily and accessibly for folks who need it, right? And so um, our Switches On platform, it's a marketing, consumer inspiration, and engagement platform um, that we've partnered with uh, the state of California to also implement. And um, what we do is house information like rebates um, and uh, contractor lists and things that people have a really hard time finding, to your point, even the manufacturer or the, or the contractor or potentially the distributor doesn't even know which product to put in a home that can qualify for a utility rebate. Um, and so something that's easy for a customer to go and, and, and click on, um, uh, you know, a, an acronym or molecule that can be remembered um, and a very uh, digitalized way to find and access uh, data that one will need to make these purchasing decisions at the end of the day. Um, and so that's what we're kind of really looking for. That's what we needed. And I think, like Kristen said, we were trying to kind of scrape and collect all of this data on our own. Um, but with, uh, in my role as the Director of State Mobilization, we have kind of a na national expansion strategy and platform. And so we're trying to take this model and implement it into new states. And um, we need a really sound, secure, and uh, readily uh, updated uh, database to be able to activate uh, the model that we're trying to deploy. Um, thank you. Uh, yeah, so we have these calculators that we're rolling out and they will rely on this data. In addition, we have um, what we call our personal electrification planner where you can go in and put a little bit of information about yourself and it will give you a tailor-made plan about how to electrify your home and what the total cost might be based on um, costs in your area and then all of the incentives that are available to you. So that will also be powered by this data. And th so that's you know our consumer-facing tools where we're trying to make this really easy and frictionless and you can just, you don't have to be Steve, you can like figure it out. Um, <laughs> Um, and, and put the whole plan together very easily in a, in a few clicks. But we also hope, you know, we, in addition to our consumer-facing tools, we're continuing to push for policy that makes electrification easier. And we do see that this will be an important tool in talking to policymakers, too, um, for the Steve situation where, you know, once you stack them all up and you see that there's not a model or there's only exactly one model that can actually stack all of the incentives, or, you know, we have heard from some policymakers saying, oh, there's, there's plenty of incentives coming. You know, all the IRA incentives are coming, so we don't need to do more because there's like that, it's, we're flush. Um, and we're not flush. So being able, but being able to have this data now and go to them and say, actually, here's the gap, you know, for a low-income ho household in your, ter in your state or for a medium-income household in your state. And so, no, we're not there yet, you know, that extra... Um, incentive from the state or the utility is important and we ha and we can show you that um, because we have that data available. Yeah, that policymaker piece is important. Um, I told you a story earlier, DeAndrea, where we, we were uh, working with uh, net metering rules and uh, there was a piece of legislation passed in Louisiana uh, by the utility down there um, that was titled net metering and we evaluated the bill and came to the conclusion that there was very little in that bill that resembled anything like net metering in spite of its name. Uh, sometimes, you know, when you can bring attention to the various facets that are kind of minimum threshold or best practice, you can really help to shape that conversation and make sure that legislation policies of different types are really moving us in the right direction and that we can avoid kind of a 
greenwashing exercise that sometimes that happens in these discussions. So it's a very important piece. Yeah, I wanted to go back on to the, you know, government angle and theme, um, but really maybe hone in on a, a key market-based issue I think that we're also trying to achieve with this, which is some of these uh, government agencies have never had to build out programs, implementation programs that include products and rebates and contractors. <laughs> And so they don't even know where to start. And you know, in the nonprofit world, you know, our I see our mission as going out and trying to solve problems in order to make things more easy for government officials or constituents, you know, just everyone, I would say. And this Node Collective really does solve a key issue that I hear over and over and over again, where it, which is, I don't know where to find this stuff. What do I, like, where do I start? Um, and so, as opposed to each individual organization trying to solve the same pro program over problem all over again, you know, Eli kind of was like, look, look, we, we got the skill set to kind of do the, the tech side, which I'm not, I'm not a techie, I'm not a, I'm not a data person, I, I'm going to act like one on the stage. Um, <laughs> but you know we're also we're bringing kind of the policy issues and you're bringing the the kind of the data solution and that kind of public private working together is is the name of the game in order to really implement change um, and particularly for this this market transformation moment that we're in yeah and uh, Steve I know desire has been around since what 1995 ish we used to use there? it at energy star we still do yeah yeah and so I guess when we're talking about something new like this, um, it's really good to see and have a clear kind of North Star vision of where we're going. But I'm curious in your mind, having tracked all different types of policy decisions and put that um, for the website, what do you think are maybe some key opportunities, but also potential challenges that we will need to work towards um, in the near term? Yeah, I mean, We've been tracking, so desire is broader than what we're doing with Node. We track, you know, regulatory policies. We track, you know, commercial incentives. We track uh, industrial things. We track a lot of different things that are kind of beyond the residential scope. But, you know, one of the things that becomes very quickly apparent in any of these subsets is the schema for actually characterizing these things. None of these people are talking to each other. Um, you know, whether it's the state policy makers. Um, I, in fact, sometimes I think they're intentionally not talking to each other or maybe looking at each other and saying, I'm going to do something different. Um, and so, you know, that's one of the hardest pieces of this. Now, I will say that there are other, there's some IT challenges. Uh, we have over various years experimented with different kind of more AI or data scraping kinds of tools to try and get the information to do this. What you find very quickly is that you can do that for the largest utilities. You can do that for some of the larger state programs. There's a lot of really crappy websites out there. Uh, there's a lot of you know, places where it's really difficult to get that information without digging in and actually having a human being go and look at something. And so we've been trying to navigate the, the way to minimize the amount of work and maximize the amount of value we can get out of automated tools while at the same time having somebody go back and deal with the pieces. You know, a lot of these are small utilities with very few employees in re rural areas of the country that don't have an IT staff to put this kind of thing online uh, and don't have a, a lot of staff to try and figure out where the similarities across or, you know, how they should compare to other programs. So, you know, I think that is one of the big values of this is trying to get, you know, more standardized best practices around schema for how to specify programs and then, you know, work, you know, as we've alluded to in, the, in your presentation towards trying to get more and more of these folks to be able to more easily give us the information rather than us having to go hunt it all down all the time uh, because it does change quite regularly. Yeah, thank you. Um, so Kristen, I, I believe uh, Rewiring America has the CEOs for electrification. Um, I'm curious, just maybe more broadly, what ways do you think Node may be able to help drive innovation um, across the U.S. We touched on this a bit, but if there's any additional just from your engagement with businesses. Um. Yeah, I think just having all of this information together, you know, we work with a lot of companies that are in the space, but they're all doing slightly, you know, they're doing like one piece of the puzzle. Um, so, you know, so we have people who are just doing insulation or who are just doing the meter. And, but of course, for the, for the homeowner, often you need 
all of those <laughs> at once. And it's easier if you kind of get that it all done at once. And so if they're just talking to the person who does insulation, they're going to know about the insulation um, option, but they're not going to be able to talk to you about the other stuff. And so having this uh, more holistic view, um, we think, could also drive a more holistic approach to that sort of whole home um, thinking as we're uh, approaching those retrofits and to those um, those organizations then working together more closely and them also thinking uh, about not just their product, but what, what else is going on in this home that they could be um, working with too. Deandra, could I just add, so the Building Decarbonization Coalition, we also have an OEM um, original equipment manufacturing um, membership uh, group as well. And the, I would say what we find really successful is being able to bring a lot of folks in the same room trying to solve problems maybe for their kind of business plan market angles, but the problems have these like overarching themes where they need someone like a third party to come in and collect all of those themes and then come up with a strategy that they don't have time for because you know, they're, they, you, they have to kind of sell products, profit, profit, profit. They need to kind of continue this revenue stream for, that's, that's their name of the game. It's not really to go out there and solve all the market problems in order for them, for their contractors or their distributors to be successful. And so I do, f I do sense a, a type of relief that the OEMs and CEOs are feeling that they have partners in the market to be able to work together to solve um, some of these these barriers and these huge challenges, and other people talking to their consumers because we know where to, you know it's not just well we know the contractor has a lot of sway in the purchasing decision, but it's also word of mouth. It's also you know trusted organizations that come in with third party insights that they do rely on to help make these decisions for you know energy efficient products in their home. Great, thank you. Um, and we've talked a good amount about community um, and the impacts that this can help with, as particularly as we're seeing more investment in uh, historically underserved communities as it pertains to anything looking at electrification, but more broadly, maybe renewables. Um, I'm curious if any of you have any um, vision about how this helps to enable that. Um, I think we did briefly mentioned the stacking and braiding, but maybe if anyone's less familiar, if someone wants to dive into maybe the summary of that and uh, how some of these initiatives hopefully will have compounding effects uh, for some of the communities who could certainly greatly benefit um, from that and have been long overdue. Uh, I'll open that up to anybody who's uh, inspired to take it first. Uh, yeah, so we are, we've been, we've been doing some demo projects and are going to be doing more um, installations in low income and disadvantaged communities. And uh, when we're going into those communities, one of the things that we, you know, have to do is get the upfront cost of the project to zero because, you know, they don't have any money to put into this. And so um, being able to both stack multiple incentives towards the same thing, you know, so you're state incentive and your utility incentive and your federal incentive for a heat pump, and then also braid incentives together for different projects within the same house. You know, so your insulation and your duct sealing in addition to your heat pump and the wiring that you need in order to get the heat pump working uh, is important for both getting that co project cost to zero, but then also meeting the whole home needs because often these homes, they don't just need a heat pump, right? They, they, need, uh, they need weatherization, they need roof repair, sometimes they need other remediation. So uh, in a market rate home, sometimes they maybe, they do just need a heat pump, that, that's it. But especially for these low income homes, being able to meet all of their needs and have all of that information like easily available to stack is gonna be important. You know, we're seeing that in what we're doing and so we know that that is important for other uh, community or state or you know uh, programs that are trying to do the same thing. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, solar for all is again a good example of this. Where uh, those of you who aren't energy people, um, you know, you're an idiot if you put solar on a house that hasn't been properly weatherized and made ready first. And you know, we see large incentives that are getting ready to roll downhill through that program. 
um, some of that money is actually specifically set aside to, ex to supplement weatherization. However, you have to be very careful that the weatherization funds coming from one source at the Department of Energy are separately accounted for from the funds coming from the EPA. Otherwise, you can't report the programs uh, out and the requirements to the various federal funding agencies properly. And so the complications of how to braid and uh, stack these incentives are going to be very real. And I think this is one of the important things that NODE is going to help with is to kind of bring us all into a standard protocol for addressing some of those kinds of things as we work through it. You know, the, the part that also I think is important is, is on the consumer protection side. Mm. There are a whole lot of, um, you know, historically bad actors out there that have taken advantage of folks with misinformation about incentives. Uh, there was a story in North Carolina about a, uh, a solar company, for example, uh, that was, you know, in essence selling little old ladies that didn't have an income tax credits associated with solar charging them $60,000 for a $20,000 solar system, telling them they would get a bunch back in tax credits, which wasn't true because they didn't pay taxes, because they didn't have an income. Uh, and so there was a lot of systematic fraud going on because of that. Um, you know, Node is not only going to systematize and regularize the data so that it's kind of comparable in various markets and we can get calculators that can help to you know, answer questions, but hopefully it's also going to bring a lot more attention to where to find credible information about the data, about the, uh, the incentives themselves to make sure that we can kind of keep some of the fraud things tamped down and not actually hurt the marketplace uh, with these incentives. Yeah, I think that's a really great point, and I believe even for some of the home energy rebate programs, I believe states are being encouraged, if not required, to come up with a consumer protection plan. Um, as a part of the rebate rollout. And you can imagine how one, a lack of standardization across really close areas um, could be quite confusing. Um, but also if someone can portray something uh, that is knowingly wrong, um, having trusted source for the community-based organizations or whomever to pull from and know is up to date um, and be able to counteract that, um, I think can have a tremendous amount of impact. So before we move on, if there's anybody else that wanted to jump into the consumer protection angle, uh, I'll give some time. If not, I have one more question before we um, open it up for the audience. Uh, let's just talk, yeah, long-term vision. Um, like I said, we are in the early days here, um, and there's a lot of interested parties for Node, um, as well as just a lot of potential opportunity as we're seeing increase in investment, um, all and also already many existing programs across the U.S. And so uh, I would love to hear everyone's maybe long-term vision, um, not just for Node, but maybe also how it intersects with your organization as we look at the, you know, what will likely be a rapid transformation of electrification in the coming years. Um, we'd love to just hear uh, what you all have your eye on and or how Node can help support that. I think, you know, long term for us, you know, we see Node as kind of a canary in the coal mine, if you will. It's a, it's a piece of the larger energy market that we're, that we track overall. And we have, you know, struggled for years with how to best get at this, what this um, process of trying to make this data more available in a standardized machine readable way to fit into the kinds of tools that, um, that our partners up here are, are working with and trying to create. You know, our job has never been to create those kinds of tools. Our job is to basically try and provide the underlying data for those tools and that, you know, fit very naturally with Node. I hope that what we learn from participation in the Node project allows us to continue to find partners to do similar things in other aspects of the energy space. Um, you know, we've got multifamily housing, which has a whole set of uh, wrinkles that are going to be more complicated and, you know, require different schema for the data collection. Um, then we've got the commercial sector, which has uh, lots of different parts and pieces in, uh, to its puzzle as well. Plus, we're constantly seeing new technologies come online, and so figuring out how to fit all of those pieces uh, together and keep adding to the, the data set, uh, you know, as different parts come available to different markets. Uh, it's all part of what we've been doing for a long time, and uh, Node is going to help us get a lot better at it. Yeah, I mean, of course, we would want to see continuing for us and others to build tools on top of this database that make it easier for customers and contractors to access this information. 
And then in addition, I'd say, just going back to the policy piece of really building and shaping um, the way that states and the federal government are approaching these incentives to make sure that they're filling the gaps where the gaps need to be filled and then coordinating where it needs to be better coordinated. So, you know, experiences where you look at the stack and see that, you know, there's only one thing that meets all the requirements, that's an opportunity to go back to the, the whoever is uh, administering those programs, whether it be the state or the utility um, or the, uh, the state through federal money and say, hey, you know, every other program in your state has this, uh, you know, uh, lining up and, and you're out of line. Could we get it all lined up so that it becomes much easier that you, they're, in addition to having the information, that it is just uh, better aligned, that if you're a customer or a contractor, you just kind of know what you're going to have on your truck or if you ask for something off the truck, it, it's going to uh, qualify for, for all of the things and you're not going to have to continue like figuring that out so much. Yeah, I see um, the Node Collective as setting a really, or establishing a really good baseline. Um, and the collection of data, you can also see the gaps. And I think particularly us in this, in this energy and climate space, we are so like head down into the weeds of our mission and our drive. We sometimes forget to look up and really study where we should go next uh, in association to like where the gaps are um, regionally or market wise. And this data set can really help us do that. And then in, in doing so, we can really strategically uh, work towards that national expansion of this clean energy transition and be more successful by arming everyone with this accessible uh, data, which, which gives the information, the education, and the insight to help with the policy, to help with the market transformation, to help underserved, underrepresented, and frontline communities access um, these new, better products that will make our homes, our buildings healthier, um, and, and you know, a better, a better lifestyle, quality of life for everyone. Thank you so much. Um, and so for folks who are curious to learn more, um, we're actually, thanks to BBC, um, having a BBC Presents on Node on May 30th. Um, it will be a Zoom webinar um, where our data working group will be presenting the schema as well as the process in which to do the initial request for um, any comments and uh, to really gain all the insights and collaboration from folks who are in the industry adjacent or just curious. Uh, so if you go to nodecollective.org, uh, you can sign up for our mailing list as well as on LinkedIn, you can find Node Collective there as well. Uh, we really are hoping to, uh, especially now that we are working with LF Energy, to really rapidly create the pipeline and the process in which to uh, get sponsors, contributors, um, partners, and uh, just thought leaders uh, to chime in and certainly help the development of what we all think will be um, incredibly high value for the electrification industry. So with that, um, I will open it up to any questions from the audience. Thanks for your patience. Um, and yeah, that was that was great to hear about. Thank you for uh, assembling the panel. Um, I was very interested in hearing the panel's perspective on the addressing the misalignment of incentives between residential landlords and the tenants who are actually paying the bill. This comes up a lot in the energy classes I teach with college students who are paying those bills, but I'm sure it's also very relevant to the um, underserved communities aspect of your work. Split incentive. Yeah, yeah there, there are certainly models out there. there are. <laughs> <laughs> getting, getting landlords to adopt any of them is another discussion, but there are models out there, and so good program design, you know, kind of leads you to a pathway where you can address that problem. Uh, I think that, you know, there's not consensus on what the best one is, and quite frankly, there are lots of different multifamily housing ownership models that make uh, the likelihood that there's one answer probably small anyway. 
Uh, but uh, we're certainly most of the solar for all programs around the country have a big multifamily element to them. And so we're going to see a lot of people experimenting with uh, different approaches to try and make sure that those incentives get to the, uh, the resident rather than to the landlord, uh, which is a requirement by EPA of that program that the, the uh, bill pay, the, not necessarily the bill payer, but the, the, the consumer is actually the one that benefits from those incentives. Yeah, I would say like right now for the space and water uh, products <laughs> that we're really seeing um, a kick up in terms of rebates for the single family home, um, there are a lot of coalitions out there that are working to figure out just this heart to head type of narrative that we are dependent on right now in order to move the landlord like an inch to consideration. It's also arming the tenants to know what to ask for when they're searching for you know new places uh, to live and to rent, to lease, whatever. Um, but also, you know, we have been looking at um, what are the favorable finance models that can protect um, tenants that are in residence now, but also arm landlords to do these upgrades and then not completely um, eliminate <laughs> half their population in their space due to an up an increase in the in the cost of um, of their rental um, and what that looks like on a percentage wise it is, is it, you know a, a, a growth scale and 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 how do we do that where um, we can keep residents in the places that they can afford now but we're also incentivizing the landlords to make this upfront cost uh, decision um, for you know a payback over time but that's those models are very much in the works right now but a lot of people are working on it not enough though I will say that and I'm so glad that you're teaching about that yeah that, that's a really good point and I I believe DOE, I don't think they require it, but they do have something about renters and trying to keep the bill within a certain threshold for a certain amount of years in terms of like the, uh, as part of like maybe what they're gonna evaluate in the auditing process um, for some of this. So um, that is also a really good benefit of um, hopefully standardized and coordinated effort is to help bring that along. And I think your points about like the financing as well, um, you know, we s I think someone was mentioning like tariffs. We've seen on bill tariffs to some extent and like co-ops and others that have tried to play uh, with helping to address some of these issues in different ways. So hopeful that with the additional investment as well as the spotlight that's being shown, we'll see some more uh, positive uh, progress in that area. Thank you. And just one more, this does not at all solve the split incentive problem, but just uh, a thing that we do tell renters is you know, you don't have control over your, your HVAC system, but if you are worried about like asthma, you know, in your children, you can get a hot plate, uh, an induction hot plate that's, that's relatively cheap and you can sort of just put it on top of your gas stove and cook on that so that you don't have the, the gas pollution in your home and then you can take it with you, you know, to your next rental. Any other questions? I appreciate everyone getting some cardio in to you, engage. Thank you work <laughs> for it. I love it. Hi, uh, thank you. And kind of building off of the last question, I had a question about how you balance the rebates and these incentives with you know other benefit programs. Considering that like low income households might, if they receive these benefits or you know these rebates, they might be priced out of the other benefits that they receive and lose those. So, as you're working with low income communities and households, what how do you balance those uh, challenges? Thank you. I don't know, this has started to come up in program design in, in some of these newer programs that are rolling out. We've been a little bit wondering how you apply incentives to a home to upgrade that home to include new appliances, weatherization, and then you elevate the value of that home and then somebody turns around and leaves the program by selling the house. Um, you know, it, there's, there's complexity to the design that um, I think that we have a lot of work to do to try and figure out how we're going to, you know, address that and make sure that the incentives do go where they're intended to go. Um, you know, you don't want to completely foreclose things like that because you actually want homeowners uh, that are in a position to actually improve their financial situation. You know, that's kind of the whole point here. Uh, but the flip side is you, you don't want to, you know, kind of 
undo the program uh, by trying to do good. So uh, we don't know what that's going to look like yet in solar for all, which is where I'm, uh, in case you can't tell, that's where my brain is right now because those, those awards have just recently come out and we're starting to figure out how to get those incentives out there. But it comes up in a lot of incentives that are targeted towards um, low income, uh, low moderate income housing. Thank you, and um, and again, that's really, our work for NODE is really just towards the structuring of collecting and gathering the available incentives and providing that in a standardized format. Um, but I do think, as was noted earlier, in terms of the research or policymaker um, types of information sharing, hopefully just having the awareness of what programs are existing and down the line how those impacts of the program design could come up, hopefully, um, could have some positive uh, benefits and impacts as well. Yeah, the, the data collection has a direct impact on program design, and yeah. so, and, yeah. and vice versa, it goes right. both ways. So it's, it's important um, to have as much transparency and as much, um, you know, commonality across this as you can. Yeah. Great. Well, um, I think that is our panel. Unless anybody has any closing remarks, I just want to thank you all for joining me, and thanks everyone for sitting in today. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks, everybody.